All right, so perhaps I will begin by introducing myself and introducing today's discussion. Thank you all so very much for joining us and for taking part in this webinar slash fishbowl discussion. Um, I'm currently sharing my screen and hopefully you can see these slides. If you have any difficulty uh, with the technical portions, please do let me know. And in addition, Olga and Nicholas, two of my colleagues are also on the line and they will be helping out with any technical support. So if you have any technical issues, especially as the conversation gets going, if I may be distracted from moderation, I suggest that you reach out to Olga and Nicholas. My name is Adrian. I work at ECLA Europe on the Sonnet project. And I'll begin by outlining a bit about the project, our agenda, and then we'll kick off the discussion. Uh, there we go. So um, the Sonnet project focuses on social innovations in energy transitions, and I will describe that a bit more in detail. We've put out a bunch of different research components and one of our research outputs was a publication that we recently released, which looks at how collaborative governance arrangements, so uh, working between city level grassroots communities, various different organizations working together to govern energy essentially, um, how those governance arrangements can be used to encourage social innovation and therefore for energy transition and our expert on the line will give a presentation to kick us off shortly. So to begin with, I will give a brief introduction, namely presenting this agenda for you, um, as well as a bit of an introduction to Sonnet. I will briefly mention the fishbowl format, although our fishbowl won't kick off for a little while, so there'll be some introduction before that. Then Marta will present our research and present what Sonnet has done in the field of collaborative governance for social innovations in energy, which you'll often see SIE written throughout this presentation that refers to social innovations in energy. Then we will start by opening the discussion simply with a selection of Sonnet cities who will reflect a bit on the research. And then we'll open up that discussion further by kicking off what we're calling the fishbowl format um, which will enable all of you as participants to also join the discussion. And then at the very end, we have a representative from another Horizon 2020 project called Urbana, who's going to sum up a bit of what we've heard, reflect on some of the key themes from the discussion, and then tell you a bit about how this discussion is relevant, not only within Sonnet, but across several projects and, and fields. So firstly, the Sonnet project, our main aim is to bring diverse groups together to make sense of how social innovation can bring about a more sustainable energy system in Europe. And what we mean by social innovation is any new practice or a revived old practice that helps better meet our needs. And in the field of energy, we often think about energy cooperatives using crowdfunding to try to support changes in the energy system, energy retrofits and, and things like that. So that is a very brief introduction to Sonnet. Um, you'll hear a lot more about what we've done as Marta introduces the main parts of our presentation. Uh, but first, I'm just going to take the last two minutes that I have to open up the idea of how the fishbowl component will work. The fishbowl discussion will be the last 30 minutes of, of the webinar. And the idea behind a fishbowl discussion, this is a format that's usually used in person, where we have an inner circle of people who speak and who actively discuss with one another. And I will be feeding those speakers questions and, and as long alongside Marta and we'll sort of be facilitating that discussion. And then typically you have those speakers sitting in an inner circle, as you can see in this image, as well as an outer circle of speakers or of rather participants who are listening and reflecting and observing. And typically if we're doing this in person, I would leave one chair open in the inner circle and invite participants to move between the outer circle and the inner circle. So move from the circle that's really about reflecting and listening to what's being discussed into the key speaker circle to be able to share their thoughts. In our online format, what we'll do instead is we'll say anyone in the inner circle, so in other words, our city speakers to begin with, will turn on their cameras and anyone in the outer circle, so all of the participants in this webinar will turn off their cameras 
And if you would like to join the inner circle in order to move to actually speaking in the discussion, please either click on the raise hand button or write raise hand in the chat. And then Olga and Nicholas will help us out by one at a time enabling participants to move from the participant circle into the speaker circle to pose your questions, answer questions, and reflect with us. The tip that we share to make sure that this goes well is that we recommend that you hide any non-video participants. And that way it's very easy and clear to see who's in the inner circle and who is in the reflection circle. Anyhow, I will go back into this in more detail when it's time to open up the fishbowl discussion. So don't worry if that seems confusing, I will repeat it. I just wanted to give people an idea of what we mean when we say that this webinar will be an interactive fishbowl. When really what we mean is that we welcome participants to turn on their cameras and microphones and join the moderated Q&A at the end. So now that all of that introduction is out of the way, that very brief introduction to Sonnet and, and to our research, let's delve into a bit more detail with a brief presentation on our most recent research on encouraging SIE through collaborative governance arrangements. And for that presentation, I invite one of our own researchers, Professor Dr. Marta Struminska Kutra. Marta, please correct me. I'm sorry. If my pronunciation is fine. Incorrect. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> um, and I will mute myself and pass the floor on to Marta, who will present the research that she's recently conducted. Yes, uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, I think I will try to uh, control the presentation, which means that I need to disable your presentation now. I hope you're fine with it. Uh, it will be easier for me to um, uh, to actually uh, control it from here. Yes. Um, so let me start with introducing myself. Uh, so you you have done quite a good job, Adrian, in uh, pronouncing my name. It's Marta Struminska Kutra, so uh, everything fine here. Uh, and I'm a professor in um, uh, uh, Kozminski University, as well as uh, as well as professor in the Witt Specialized University in Norway. Uh, but within Sonnet, I'm um, uh, participating as a representative of Kozminski University, and I'm one of the researchers um, that are actively engaged in, uh, uh, in many activities connected with, uh, um, with Sonnet, uh, with the Sonnet project. So in a way, as you will see, um, I will present a part of our research and when presenting it, I'm in fact, um, in a way, standing on the shoulder of giants because I'm extensively using work that my colleagues already have done uh, before because our project started in, uh, well, more than one year ago. So quite a big job was, uh, uh, was done already. So what I'm going to present to you today um, is based on the report that is uh, available on uh, our web page. Uh, so you can, if you are interested in uh, a more in-depth uh, reading, you can just access the, the report under, um, under this link that I'm presenting here. Report is titled um, Report on Encouraging Social Innovation in Energy Through Collaborative Governance Arrangements. And I am the main author uh, of this report and the main researcher behind. But this research uh, was um, supported very effectively by Maria Stadler, uh, who was participating um, in uh, some of the interviews and was very, very helpful also in a sense of uh, uh, collaborative thinking about uh, what, what does it mean, uh, what we actually see uh, in, in our research. Um, so let me start with a, a quite basic question, um, why social innovation and why governance? So what is the connection between the two? And I would like to start with a very practical comment that was uh, made by one of our interviewees from Bristol, uh, who told us 
we, that means the city, only control more or less 1% of the city's emission. Uh, we have influence over maybe 30 or 40%. So that leaves about 60% or more that we have almost no influence or control over whatsoever. So when we talk about energy systems and energy transitions, sustainable transitions, we are always talking about complex systems. And when we talk about complex systems, we mean that many actors are involved. We mean that uh, their interests, perspectives and values are quite often not aligned and even contradictory. Um, we also talk about the situation where no, uh, none of the actors have uh, full control uh, over, um, over actions that, and the results of actions that can be uh, undertaken within the system. So um, if we are talking about complex systems, we are also talking about complex problems and they can be uh, solved um, by actors who are cooperating with each other and who are actually engaging in innovative processes of thinking and designing solutions that would be uh, novel and that would address the, the existing problems. So this is why social innovation in energy and within our project, uh, we are defining social innovations uh, in the energy sector as combinations of ideas, objects, and or activities that change social relations and evolve new ways of doing thinking and organizing energy. What is very important here is that um, while social innovation is quite often associated with bottom-up uh, grassroots movements, uh, we are adopting a bit broader understanding of social innovation. Uh, I will introduce it in a, uh, in a minute with some examples. But the important thing for us here is that uh, social innovation can be actually triggered uh, or started at very uh, different levels of governance. It can be started by the national um, authorities, it can be started by local governments, it can be started by grassroots organization, it can be started by very different actors from different sectors of a society, be it private, public, non-public. Uh, when we speak about governance uh, for um, social innovation in energy, we talk about a complex process uh, through which a plurality of public, non-governmental and private actors interact uh, in order to formulate, promote and implement social innovation in the energy sector. Uh, we uh, within SONET uh, or within the research that is particularly focused on, on governments, uh, governance arrangements, uh, focus on public governance here. So when conducting this particular research on uh, part of the research um, that, is, uh, that delivers a background for the report, uh, we uh, took uh, under consideration um, the question what public administration, public governance entities, agencies can do uh, while governing social processes connected with, uh, with innovating around energy. So um, in this case, uh, public administration or city administration to be more specific uh, is in fact the subject that performs governance. Uh, and we focus on public administration, uh, which on encompasses both elected and unelected officials because, um, because they have a spe very special position uh, and role within um, social innovation in energy fields. Uh, so they can um, change the rules in these fields. They can introduce new rules. Uh, then they can modify um, already existing uh, rules, procedures in order to facilitate uh, development of social innovation uh, in energy. Um, looking at the overall, uh, overall structure of, of the project, um, 
the overall aim of SONET was to co-create a rich understanding of the diversity processes, contributions, successes, and future potentials of social innovation in the energy sector. And um, I'm only reporting a very small part of this, uh, of this exercise, uh, of this attempt to, to facilitate understanding uh, of, um, of the phenomenon. Uh, and I focused on two questions. So first question was, what are the governance arrangements related to social uh, innovation in energy? Um, and the second question uh, was uh, how governments, governance arrangements relate to, uh, related to um, social innovation in energy are actually evolving over time. And um, these answers to these two questions are um, captured in the report. As a first answer, uh, I have or we have uh, developed um, sustain, uh, sorry, a social innovation energy governance typology that illustrates the diversity of governance arrangements used by city administration to facilitate and support uh, social innovation in energy. Um, and within the second question and within the uh, attempt of uh, answering the second uh, question, uh, four propositions were uh, developed that enhance understanding of, uh, of how social innovation in energy actually um, unfolds. But before uh, I start to talk about governance, I will um, say a few words about social uh, innovation uh, in energy as such, what, what we mean by um, social innovation in energy and what are the examples of the initiatives behind. And this is exactly what I meant when I said that I'm basically standing on shoulders of giants because a huge work was already done by uh, our colleagues from SONET to uh, build a typology uh, of um, social innovation in energy. Uh, they have reviewed um, more than 500 cases of uh, that were initially qualified as social innovation in energy and they were um, playing around with these cases in an attempt to uh, to build up a typology and they came up with a typology uh, that um, presents different um, social innovation in energy types according to uh, two dimensions. So first dimension is the question, what type of interactions are we talking about here? So we can talk about cooperation with people working together towards a common goal. Uh, we can talk about exchange. Uh, we can uh, see people within social innovation initiatives exchanging uh, different types of resources. Um, we can talk about competition. So when we talk about social innovation in energy, we actually also talk about um, market competition. So we, we are talking about business models. And we can also talk about conflict, uh, about relationships that are in fact conflictual. We can speak about um, people who are um, innovating around energy uh, and are, for example, de um, developing uh, subversive um, actions like social movements. And all of these types of interactions uh, mean that people actually do uh, different things, uh, they think a little bit um, differently or according to specific uh, logics or lines of thinking, and they organize uh, differently as well. So I will only quickly uh, give you some examples, and I'm using here slides prepared by my colleagues uh, at the, uh, one year ago, actually, uh, already, time flies. Um, so when we uh, when we talk about cooperation uh, and um, examples of social innovation uh, in energy uh, and cooperation, we can uh, give examples of local communities uh, generating electricity together, uh, and these um, uh, these communities want to live together in a harmony. Uh, so they uh, they have a common goal uh, that they pursue. 
uh, we can talk about cross-sectoral collaborations that include working groups that want uh, social, ecological and democratically controlled energy supply. In this case, in Berlin, so we can talk here, we can give you an example of an uh, organization called Berliner Energetisch. Uh, we can also give an example of a cooperative um, organization for action. And here, an uh, example of social innovation would be a um, company cluster that strives for uh, and above average um, research and uh, environment to introduce uh, clean tech technologies. Um, when we uh, talk about exchange that is more directed towards, not towards the common goal, but towards exchanging resources, uh, we um, can um, give examples of um, uh, community and company that tests the future of decentralized power supply by local, uh, local smart grid. Uh, we can talk about educational initiatives. Uh, we can talk about uh, online marketplace forming an intermediary uh, between, uh, between um, renewable energy suppliers and customers. Um, we can talk about competition as well and about innovating uh, within relationships that involve competition. Uh, so we can talk about uh, photovoltaics installation uh, company securing competitive advantage through crowdfunding, which is an innovative approach to uh, innovative business model. But we can also talk about organized competition and games uh, like platform organizing a competition between students uh, challenging the biggest savings uh, in um, challenging them to achieve the biggest savings in energy. Um, and when we talk about conflict, uh, we can talk about some innovative strategies used by social movements uh, to um, to advocate for uh, for sustainable energy transitions. So the, uh, I wanted to introduce these cases so that we have a common understanding of social innovation in energy. Uh, and now I will um, talk a bit more about how all these initiatives can actually be governed uh, by public actors. Yes, Niklas? Five minutes left. Okay. Uh, who um, who use this energy that is already out there and harness it to to facilitate um, uh, to facilitate um, um, sustainable energy transitions. So what we have done, and this is uh, actually very small scale research, but it is a part of a larger. Uh, larger part, and there will be a very interesting interactions between the, the research that I've done and uh, the rest of the Sonnet research. So uh, we have, uh, I've prepared a documentary analysis of policy documents, web pages. Uh, we have got some insights from reflection circles. So uh, that was um, a dialogue over cooperative um, uh, innovative processes that involve uh, that involve both academics and practitioners, but basically most of uh, of the time uh, I was relying on semi-structured interviews connect connected to, uh, conducted within uh, uh, sonnet cities, six sonnet cities, and I have conducted or we have conducted together with Maria to. Um, to interviews per city. Uh, and we, we were talking with uh, people who uh, were in leadership positions, uh, person responsible, people responsible for um, or having possibility to influence cities uh, policies and or organizational operations uh, with people engaged and or overseeing collaborative processes and having um, long year experience or relatively long experience in public administration in connection with issues uh, of energy and um, sustainability. So typology. Typology uh, is based on the typology of, um, uh, of social innovation in energy that I've already talked about and I will uh, tell you in a minute how it was constructed. But an important dimension of a typology is uh, in fact connected with the diverse modes of governance. So we can 
basically govern or steal uh, or not steal but steer uh, social relationships through uh, hierarchies which means through command and control so we can tell people to follow the rules basically uh, we can steer social relationships through markets which means that we can focus on efficient allocation of resources uh, with the use of market logic. So we can, for example, um, um, make something cheaper uh, to, enhance, uh, to enhance demand. Uh, we can create a market, like a market for CO2 emissions. Uh, we can create change in market equilibria uh, because we, for example, introduce, I mean, we as public administration uh, introduce uh, taxation criteria or because we um, introduce green procurement rules. And the third mode of governance that can be used uh, is based on networks. It uses networks. So we can try steer, enhance, um, in this case, social innovation in energy by using networks. Uh, and it is based on uh, flat relationships. Um, it's based on the sharing of common resources and uh, on negotiations. So this type of governance can be performed by the administration, for example, by taking the role of network organizer. Uh, so this is the typology uh, I've um, uh, came up with uh, eventually during the analysis. It's far from uh, finished it's uh, it still requires some um, um, some work but the important thing is that we have this three types of governance on the left hand side um, so uh, we can either govern um, enhance um, social innovation through hierarchies markets or networks and we have here um on the uh, in the columns uh, types of social um interactions that are typical for specific type of um uh of social innovation initiative so if we start to dig a bit deeper into the or to explore the types that that emerged uh, we can see that cooperation um, or sustainable or social innovation based in energy um, that evolves through cooperation can be uh, enhanced by uh, hierarchies. So, for example, uh, hierarchical modes of governance uh, would mean here that um, politicians, like for example, elected and appointed officials, uh, introduce policies that open a space uh, for the creation of bottom-up processes of collaboration. So, for example, energy communities, eco-villages, and energy cooperatives that function as networks would not exist without regulations, making it possible to produce and sell energy. Uh, the examples of uh, social innovation in energy enabled by such decisions, such political decisions, uh, are, for example, eco-villages in Netherlands. Uh, it's also Bristol Energy Network uh, in the UK. Um, there are policies and policy documents that provide a justification for the city to enter national and international networks. Uh, being one of the major spaces uh, for uh, SEI uh, knowledge creation and dissemination. So here example is provided by the city of Grenoble, for, which uh, prioritizes uh, international cooperation in the sustainability area. So if the top-down decision is actually done, if the policy is introduced, there is an important justification to enter uh, the cooperation. Uh, then um, city administration can also directly create uh, local networks uh, developing social innovation. For example, through establishment of participatory projects, energy neighborhoods in which citizens engaged in a community building and experimentation and knowledge creation. I see you, Niklas. Uh, you want me uh, to uh, wrap up wrap maybe? Up? And then I think we'll have time to uh, dig more into these um 
types mm -hmm. also in the discussion. So yeah, that would be great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. So I will just try to give you maybe some examples from uh, that involve markets as well and competition and conflict. So I think I would, would need like two more minutes. Do you think it's doable? Okay, two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, um, so, um, for example, uh, how, um, how now I need to choose something. It's so difficult. Let's let's uh, look at the competition. Uh, how um, public administration can actually um, govern. Uh, competition by using market mechanisms. So we see here sev three points. Um, and first of them is uh, ownership. Uh, it's, uh, it's about full or partial ownership of companies uh, providing and distributing electricity and heating. And that actually allows uh, public administration to directly um, influence company decisions uh, through the board. And that's the case of city of Grenoble uh, and uh, representatives of Grenoble city, city emphasize that uh, having their own energy company, which by the way is quite exceptional for French um, um, institutional environment, uh, gives them a fair amount of independency in uh, shaping and implementing energy policies by influencing energy prices. Um, some of the municipalities around Basel outsource energy provision uh, and management to energy cooperatives. Uh, the city of Warsaw plans to um, upgrade energy efficiency of public buildings by outsourcing um, uh, by outsourcing um, energy management uh, to a private company. And this company would use energy management tools that were actually collaborative, collaboratively developed uh, with building um, with users, uh, it's about um, application for, they've built an application for monitoring energy use and uh, proposing multiple scenarios for energy savings. Um, and city administration, and that's the case of Bristol, also uses its own purchase, uh, purchasing power to set sustainable market trends, like for example, exchanging the fleet uh, of cars into electric cars. Um, and so on and so forth. I really like uh, hope that we are going to select some of the examples while um, while having a discussion, um, because because some of them, uh, most of them, are actually very uh, very interesting options. And I think it's a very interesting to see an overview um, of them as a, a sort of a landscape of, of possibilities. So uh, I'm looking forward to unpack uh, this, this types. Thank you very much, Marta. I think that that, unfortunately, there's just so much to discuss <laughs> that it's just really difficult to sum it all up into a webinar. But I think that was already a really excellent overview about what we're really thinking about here. And you know, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that one of the main takeaways that I've taken from your presentation is that we're looking at how can we steer social relationships? And furthermore, you did, conducted interviews and looked at documents to look at how are cities doing this in the name of energy transition? How are mm. cities steering and supporting social relationships to help us to create a, a more sustainable energy system? Mm. Um, and I think that there's lots and lots still to unpack. And I think well, hopefully we can make use of this discussion to do that. So I've just taken over sharing my screen to, to suggest that we start with opening up the discussion. And Marta, I'll ask that you also stay on the line so that we can ask you questions, but also that you can feel free to direct questions at the cities to try to kind of keep the discussion going. So we'll discuss just with our city speakers for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we will kick off the fishbowl format. So I, I'm going to begin by asking that our uh, main city speakers turn on their cameras and unmute themselves to be able to join in our discussion. If you have any difficulties with that, please feel free to message Olga and Nicholas who can provide you with some support. So on the line with us, we have 
Fabien Dupré. Fabien, can you wave so folks know? Hello. Hello Fabien is joining us from the city of Grenoble. We also have Martin Gradsky from Warsaw. Uh, Matt Jones, Hello. who's joining us from Bristol. Nicole Schwartz from the city of Basel. And finally, Sabrina Hoffman from the city of Mannheim in Germany. And these are five of our six sonnet cities. Uh, and these also represent five of the six cities um, whose representatives were interviewed in order to really create um, this research that, that we've shared with you now. So I think that what I'd like to do uh, while we begin thinking of our first questions is I'd like to ask, uh, to pose a poll to ask our audience a little bit about your familiarity with this term collaborative governance. So I'm just launching a poll now. It would be great to hear from how familiar you are with this term and what it means to you so that we can establish whether we need Marta to provide a little bit more detail before we start discussing collaborative governance in the context of, of our sonnet cities. So I see now about half the people have voted, so we can give it one more moment. Wow, I'm very impressed. We're already at 80% voted. <laughs> Perfect. So I will now end the poll and share results with everyone. So it looks like the majority of people, a little bit more than 60%, understand generally what collaborative governance means. So I don't know that we have to go into a deep dive of defining it, but perhaps could use a little bit more detail. So maybe I'll start by posing a question to all of our speakers, the five city representatives and to Marta, a little bit of um, when you think about collaborative governance, in the context of social innovation and in the context of this interview, what does that look like in your city? What does it mean for you to think about collaborative governance for social innovation? Um, I can talk from Bristol's perspective. Um, I think uh, right down to a practical level on projects that I've worked on, um, I think it's uh, a good analogy is um, people sat around the top table and having equal roles from different um, stakeholder groups. Um, so from a city authority, um, you could have different tiers of what you define as collaborative. You know, you could just have those people around the table and you've ticked that box or uh, have they got a true seat at the table as in, if they suggest something that perhaps is different to um, to what your current course of action is, are you willing to invest in that uh, collaboration um, and make changes, which is challenging given, um, you know, we, we probably have, we all have our own, you know, we're all people, we all have our own set predefined ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly in those power dynamics where traditionally uh, uh, local authorities would usually just say it, Mm, thanks for the idea but we're going to do it like this um so in bristol and some of the projects i've worked on um we've tried to work in that genuine collaborative way so one example would be on a project where we co-designed the recruitment strategy for the participants um on a on a smart energy smart homes project um and that literally was was equaling drafting putting pen to paper and agreeing and having joint sign off so um yeah it's just an anecdote from bristol yeah absolutely and i'm wondering if perhaps another city could jump in with an example of a time that you used collaborative governance to support sie in your city so really getting into the details of what what that sie looked like and Matsin, why don't you begin start us off Thank you. Sorry, my phone is ringing all the time. I will turn this off. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I, I think I, I should share the, the bright example we had in Warsaw, which is the, the citizens panel. I don't know whether it's the, it's the name in English or not. If yes, please not. If not, correct me. Uh, yeah. So basically, we invited uh, almost 80 participants representing, representing different genders, different groups, different 
um, the, the ages, young ones, older ones, um, people from different districts to, let's say, uh, a very fruitful and particip participatory discussion. Even uh, with the overarching goal of coming up with a set of measures to be implemented by the city, if possible, if they are doable. And what is very, very important, and uh, to build up on what uh, what Matt said, our president, uh, President Chaskowski, committed himself to implement those measures even before they came up. So, so he, he didn't know what the measures will be, but he committed that if possible, if it's doable, if we can, uh, then we will do it. And uh, we are, uh, I mean, the panel is over. We came up with more, more measures than we have expected, to be very honest, because almost 50... Uh, 50 ideas uh, reached 80% uh, of votes. And now we have to struggle with the roadmap, how to implement this and, and so on. But if, if this is not a democracy and uh, let's say uh, a crowdsourcing uh, uh, example, what is, uh, you know, and what is very important, we facilitated the whole dialogue, we facilitated the discussions, we provided experts, we provided uh, some presentations so they can understand uh, what we are discussing. And uh, this one was focused on energy efficiency, which is you know, absolutely crucial for Warsaw, as we have now target for, for reaching out climate neutrality by 2015. So energy efficiency measures are, are, are so, so, so important. Uh, and I think this is the best example I can give. And uh, I can, I can, we are happy to share any, any, let's say, insights if your cities or your networks are thinking of uh, organizing such panel in future. We did it successfully. Hopefully, it will be successfully implemented and happy to share the results, the bad practices, good practices, and so on. Thanks. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yes, Marta. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll just start at the bottom. I wanted to uh, add that actually um, I've also uh, included this um, innovation of uh, citizens panel into the typology uh, as I think it's quite an important uh, type, especially that when we were thinking about um, social innovation in energy, um, and when we were considering the types, we uh, found it a bit difficult to uh, unpack the conflict uh, uh, type. And what Martin just mentioned here, it's, uh, I think it's a nice example of um, governing conflict because as, uh, as mentioned within city panels, you have um, people who, are, uh, who have very opposite interests, uh, who have very opposite ideas. They come from very different places. Um, and, uh, and yet they are um, governed, they are, uh, there is a space for them to dialogue and to meet. Uh, so it is an example, in fact, of how, how this network-based um, thinking, uh, dialoguing, uh, is, uh, can be used to, to actually manage a conflict. So just an addition, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm very glad to be considering how all of these fit into our topology, mm -hmm. right? And to consider how the topology can help us to better unpack all these different innovations. Um, Nicole, I believe you also had your hand up. Would you like to speak a little bit to the experience in Basel? Um, no, I was uh, actually thinking about something and typing, <laughs> asking Martin a question, which I can actually also uh, give back um, like this. Um, I think it's very uh, interesting to know how do you get into that sort of panel as a citizen in, uh, in I mean, there, there has to be some process even to invite people and to, to, to be sure that they come, but also um, uh, you, if once you are part of this panel, you have certain expectations, which is very difficult to deal with um, as a government. So I would like to know more about that part of the involvement part of this project, if possible. Sure, happy to. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, it's worth mentioning that I was not there when the panel was organized. So I, I don't know the very deep details how it was technically organized. But what I know 
uh, the people re responsible for organizing this sent out like uh, how many 80,000 invitations to to inhabitants and then based on that based on their uh, let's say re responses they uh, they they uh, divided these into the groups and then again um, uh, like randomly choose people uh, to be to be participants so okay. as far as i know this was the the way to do it uh, which is i mean it's completely fair it's not like it's not based on our let's say contacts priorities or you know easy people to discuss but uh, to provide the, the most representative group as possible um okay yeah and when it comes to when it comes to the uh, the, the measures the ideas whatever we call it that were voted at the end what is more important these are not only ideas of participants uh, like uh, all inhabitants uh, was informed that they can uh, let's say they can provide uh, an ideas for measures to be discussed later on so it's you know the, the 80 people were voting but the ideas came from the entire city from organizations from even from the the, the city departments um yeah. we voted at the end so that's how it that's how it looked like yeah i think that that question brings up a really important point about how we make sure that these collaborative arrangements address everyone and, and reach particularly vulnerable groups. Sabrina, I know that that's been a real focus in Mannheim to think about how we can connect with not only the people who, you know, have ample access to the internet and who are really already involved. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you collaborate with those who are a bit more vulnerable and what, what you're testing out in Mannheim. Um, yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Um, yeah, over the years, uh, the city of Mannheim has transformed its administration system in whole. So, which started as a, let's say, mere citizen service administration and changed into a participation administration and then into a co creation administration. And the outcome of this is the mission statement Mannheim 2030. It's uh, very similar to what Martin just said about Warsaw. And um, in, it is in Mannheim's strategic guideline to carry out sustainable developments um, in the years to come. And this process was a two years long process. And we had lots of citizen panels, um, discussions online and physically when there were no uh, Corona times. And um, yeah, we the process the process has shown that there has to be a deep understanding on the role of social acceptance for achieving um, climate goals. So this was the like the crossover topic, not just cross departmental in our city, but also um, in different. Um, what, let's say to see the diversity of the people. And for example, for that, we, um, the mayor uh, of our city, that's a really big point of success that you have your top mayors or political leaders uh, with you in this topic, invited a sample of um, the diversity of Mannheim um, to a few panels. So there was one point, the other point um, to get to vulnerable people is for example, um, the, our, um, participation platform um, where you can give your wishes, um, critics and uh, concerns about individual projects, um, vote for measures or find allies, uh, allies for your project implementation. For example, a, a community solar system and also the, the budget which comes with it. So, um, we have the participation platform and a participatory budget where citizens can decide over a special amount of the city budget. And I think an example that you more or less mentioned is our uh, heat action plan in Mannheim that we are currently um, creating. And these are already vulnerable people. So we are working with the citizen panels for once, but also the digital format. And we are using the newspapers and posters and postcards uh, in the city to address 
really everyone and also um, children and youth participation is a big uh, focus on that too. Yeah, and that's very timely. I think we're really seeing a, a great increase in in youth activism and in the acknowledgement of, of the real power of youth activism as well. Um, Marta, I see you have a question, but I also want to give Fabian a chance yep. quickly to respond. Um, Fabian, I think you've had your hand up for a moment. So if you have anything in particular you'd like to share, uh, please feel free to do that as well. But I was also interested in something that Sabrina mentioned, which was um, you brought in the importance of having support from the political elected officials. And I think it's important for us to note that collaboration isn't only between you know, city administration and citizens, it's also between administrators and the elected level. And Fabian, I was wondering if in addition to providing any inputs that you have from the discussion so far, if you could speak a little bit to that side of collaborative governance. Excellent. I, I mean, it was to answer your question about what can be um, governance, I mean, new governance arrangements for Grenoble and collaborative governance. Um, I mean, first I would, like, I would like to start by saying that um, sometimes we can wonder if uh, those new arrangements on in general social innovation is not a way to get uh, getting around the lack of courage of politicians. Um, but at the same time, politicians, um, I mean, response to the demands coming from the voters, citizens. So let's say for Grenoble, uh, we think that trying to change those dynamics of power is, um, I mean, from the bottom up can also work and can be. Uh, encouraged by the politicians, help them to have a more ambitious environmental policy. Because Marta introduced also the fact that the city as an administration um, only has control over a small part of the territory's emissions. And um, the city of Gonob is trying with the metropole, metropolis, uh, to mobilize federate partners of the territory for co-governance, co-porting. Uh, so we have also part of the budget devoted to citizen projects, a participatory project with candidatures and votes open to all residents every year. And um, right now, we are trying to create uh, new hybrid decision-making structures. Also in the context of uh, Grenoble will be a green capital 2022. It's a new plan program that aims to encourage cities to to develop actions in favor of um, energy transitions. So we are trying with the metropolis to create, um, I mean, shared, new shared governance, co-porting uh, with citizens, associations, companies, research, via networks, via local uh, IPCC, via um, citizens conventions. Um, and I would say politicians are, are really encouraging this, those new initiatives. Uh, so yeah, that's more or less the, the context. I mean, we are trying to create those new structures for the moment. We have only, um, we have only started to plan those actions for 2022. And uh, let's say the main difficulties are more about um, human resources available. I mean, also with the current context of COVID. And um, we are also trying to find new fundings to, to create those hybrid structures. So I, I don't know if Adrian, I, Adrian, if I really could answer, could answer your question, I have to ask. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you made quite an interesting statement there about using, near the beginning, about using these sort of um, citizen platforms to get support for things that we might not always have the courage to, <laughs> to say politically is, is of interest. Um, Nicole, I think I'd, I'd like to turn to you next. I believe that you're the last member of our panel who hasn't had a chance yet to really present an input. But what I might suggest is that I quickly introduce what the fishbowl will look like. And then while you uh, make a contribution, people can start to raise their hands and, and ask to join the fishbowl if, if that works all right. So I'm happy now to open up the floor for the fishbowl discussion. 
So how this will work as a reminder is that if you would like to join this panel of speakers to actually ask questions in person and also provide your own input, please either click on the raise hand button or write the words raise hand in the chat. And then my colleagues, Niklas and Olga will give you permission to unmute yourself and we will invite you into the discussion in order to try to ensure that several people are able to join the discussion. Um, we'll ask that you limit your participation in the inner circle to just about two minutes so that we have ample time for several people to join us. So now while um, folks in the audience take a chance to express their interest or to ask any technical questions in the chat. I'd like to turn back to, to Nicole to provide your inputs. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, what I just uh, thought when you were talking about the different uh, citizen panels and possibilities of inviting people to cooperate with the government, uh, be it uh, on the level of the politics or um, uh, representatives of um, the government. I was thinking that maybe um, in Switzerland it is a completely different situation than in the rest of Europe. Uh, since we have a democratic system, <laughs> which is very, we, we have very often um, um, election, uh, no, <laughs> Uh, we, we discuss about topics that concern uh, very basic things in our uh, society and we go to elections four times a year at least, <laughs> so we don't have that kind of representative uh, democracy where people uh, only for, uh, for uh, every four years choose people to talk uh, politics, I would say. So it is very interesting to me to see that for us, it would be much more difficult to create some kind of citizen panel because there are already many organs um, uh, uh, actively invo involved in policy, uh, uh, policy making. Um, um, nevertheless, we in Basel, we have many um, challenges on, on the topic, on the level of uh, more a game status of uh, challenge where you can um, give in your ideas like in a hackathon 24 hours and you you put in your best ideas um, but this is uh, um, really not part of the policy making process which is really a, a gaming part if if i may say so we, but i think it's a very interesting notion also to me to see that um this um um uh, uh, activities from citizens, um, they are completely different, I think, in Switzerland and in the rest of Europe. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I've, I've heard quite a bit about the Swiss system of having a lot decided by referendum. And it seems like it's really just a, a very different starting point in terms of how you consider collaborative governance. Um, yes, Marta, please go ahead. Yes, uh, I, I think indeed it's a very interesting comparison, especially when we think about collaborative governance, uh, because um, on one hand we have uh, this representative democracy, that means voting, but you are voting uh, um, whether you want or not to have a certain type of solution, while collaborative governance or solution-based governance goes more into a direction of harnessing ideas and um, trying to develop ideas collaboratively before they can be voted. Uh, so, um, but this is, uh, I also, uh, I remember very well uh, um, the example from ba Basil, you just mentioned, Nicole, uh, about the hackathon, uh, where you actually harness creativity and energy of networks to, um, uh, to gather some ideas about how to tackle um, energy related challenges. So in terms of typology, again, uh, it is how um, networks uh, based management uh, governance, sorry, can be used uh, in uh, competition. Uh, because hackathon is a form of a competition that actually um, facilitates uh, a, a discussion or creation process. So that was a very, very interesting um, example as well. And just briefly to uh, also to address the issue of political leadership. It was very central uh, in all the, the interviews. So this, I wanted to relate again to typology 
So it's a, it's not all, but a lot of it. It's about political decision, top-down decision about introducing a certain type of rules and procedures. And here I want to relate to what Sabrina said about the uh, Mannheim's approach to development of. Um, city mission it was a similar case with warsaw and develop and uh how um development strategy was uh was approached as a process that it was a very collaborative participatory process and this was actually also a way of governing conflict or conflicting perspectives visions and issues um, and both internally and externally. So this is very, very interesting. I will not go into details here, but uh, but this internal processes uh, were very interesting as well. Um, but again, the decision needs to be taken on the top and there needs to be willingness to enter collaborative processes as well as to uh, give them this flavor of sustainability um, transitions. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I've stopped screen, sharing my screen for one moment, Marta, so that you can pull up the typology, which I think would also be good background as we continue to kind of get into these points. I think one thing that, um, that seems relevant here is the idea of funding and how do we fund these citizen um, engagements, but also how we can use collaborative governance to think about funding and to think a little bit more about how we fund the energy transition. And I know that, Matt, that there's some experimenting going on in Bristol with harnessing, for example, crowdfunding. And I'm wondering if you could discuss that in part by looking at this topology and seeing what kind of ways of governing can we use to frame crowdfunding for energy transition. Is that question clear? I, I'm sort of saying it as I think it out. It might be a little bit unclear. Um, yeah. Um... I guess we probably haven't considered um, what implicate like the governance implications of that because it's um, uh, it, it, how to say it? it it's a kind of bit of a quite honestly it's, it's sort of sort of a means to an end rather than purely as a governance tool. Does that make sense? So a, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, 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 it could be that there is um, uh, enhanced uh, broader governance. Um, outcomes or externalities if you will from that process but at this time it's not the core objective of running that process for it to be a more collaborative governance exercise um although yeah as i say that would be probably an externality of it um however it, it there's a sliding scale there isn't there it, it depends the extent to which within a crowdfunding initiative, whether we're just presenting the thing that we want to have crowdfunding saying, this is what we want to do, or whether we're presenting a range of different options, because I think we need to provide probably some, usually you need some start of a tent to open up a discussion about, about where to say spend or put time and resource into, whether that's government or uh, community um, donated resources. Um, now, our model and the model that um, in the UK through uh, a organisation that run this type of financing initiative called Abundance, um, we had a meeting with those, those guys recently. As yet, there isn't really um, the development as it could be in terms of the um, almost like the participatory budgeting element to that process, because that's kind of another that's an an entire mm. another layer actually um uh that, that's part of this um mm -hmm. so yeah so that sorry that's quite a broad ramble but um in in essence um the governance arrangements haven't really been developed i would say um uh, in in the model um but there is clearly a lot of opportunity there um my only caveat i guess would be um what's the there's always a cost of engagement and given that these projects are, uh, are running on fine budgets hence we're looking for you know uh, crowdfunding essentially um, that in turn there's got to be um, value in that 
exercise and the way it's rolled out i'm very much for it but there has to be it has it has to stack up in the business model otherwise it, we we wouldn't even get to the point of delivering on the initial intended um uh, objective um does that does that make sense yeah, it does. I mean, I think that it also puts into perspective how many layers there are to this. I mean, we're talking about governance in the sense of choosing priorities and governance in the sense of setting up how we're going to attack things that, you know, it, it comes into play at so many levels that this isn't just a pick one square on the topology and that's what we'll do kind of thing. It's it's really an iterative process. I, I At least that's what I've gotten from from your response. Um, we've had the first participant join us now in the fishbowl discussion. Uh, Mr. Kuban, I'd like to invite you to please unmute yourself and, and provide a contribution as you'd like. Okay, I've been able to do it. Thank you. Uh, this is this is Baha Kuban from Istanbul, from Demir Energy, and uh, we are quite active in the smart city projects in the uh, Horizon 2020. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for this very interesting discussion and very interesting project. Uh, just one small comment. Uh, in the energy sector, as you know, we are uh, facing a, a well-entrenched uh, sector, technology and uh, investment uh, and uh, finance uh, intensive sector, where we have a, a great deal of lock-in, both institutionally and technologically. Uh, so we cannot really uh, say that we are starting from a, a, a clean, clean uh, slate. Uh, we are, uh, you know, confronting a very strong uh, political opposition, as well as uh, uh, you know, important uh, uh, barriers to entry. And that's why most of the time, uh, democratization of the energy sector has been uh, minusculely uh, uh, successful in, in many countries, unless it is supported by uh, large-scale uh, national uh, policy. Uh, such as in Germany, for example, or, or uh, some other countries that uh, I could name. Uh, so uh, I, I see that Sone is doing a very good job in, uh, uh, in looking at the uh, situation, also uh, coming down to municipality level with uh, specific examples. Um, but uh, can, how can we really uh, make a, a greater punch of, uh, of, of uh, uh, let's say, those forces in, in society that do uh, uh, have a a uh, stake in democratizing the energy system. Uh, we can see that this is a largely political problem, uh, so it needs a political solution. Uh, and uh, we cannot hope that everybody is uh, on the same line. Uh, you know, we, we cannot hope to have a greater coalition that has the same, uh, you know, exact vision and uh, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, envisages the same kind of uh, society. So uh, we may have to go with coalitions that, uh, you know, are, are flexible and, uh, are sort of uh, transformative alliances uh, that go into one or other uh, part of the, the energy transition. This could be in the mobility sector, this could be in the energy uh, supply, or uh, in other uh, important sectors of, uh, of the energy transition. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, uh, what is the best way of uh, organizing this uh, transformative alliances uh, that we so often uh, come across in, in our smart city projects and uh, uh, almost uh, condemn the, the projects to to remain uh, pet projects of municipalities. Uh, what is what is the the, the main uh, drive uh, or logic uh, behind this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, would one of our cities or Marta like to take on a, a first response? I can uh, I can try. Uh, it's uh, because it's I'm saying try because it's a very crucial uh, question, and I think it's um, uh, definitely uh, it's a very important point that uh, that you're making that we are not starting from the scratch here. Uh, it's not a tabula rasa. We are this uh, this field is already heavily populated with institutions and entrenched interests, um, and how to govern that. Um, uh, I think that I was uh, during, especially during making interviews, I was uh, many times uh, hearing uh, that on the city level, uh, and that was also expressed in the presentation, you have a limited ability really to uh, proceed with some projects. Uh, so a lot of it, and it's truism now, I know, uh, it depends on the national level policies, uh, whether they um, uh, 
produce specific type of feed-in tariffs or not, whether they tax um, investments uh, in um, renewable energy and community-based energy or not. So, uh, for example, in the case of UK, we had exactly these issues uh, going on, that a lot of um, things uh, going on in Bristol were, in fact, uh, made more difficult because of the decisions that were taken on the national uh, level, uh, within political processes on, of the national level. So I think that the multi-level governance is in fact a key but how to look for alliances and how to build this multi-level connections that allow to push the process uh, forward uh, that's the very uh, context dependent question and matt from your perspective from bristol would you like to um provide any more details on, on the example that marta gave so around the relationship between uh, the impact of, levels. yeah yeah i mean um i'm not sure how uh in detail how local government and um is imp influenced by national government in other countries but i've certainly heard of some examples where there seems to be a lot more autonomy and indeed budget autonomy in in, in particular um so I guess just even just a, one slight anecdote, for example, that our government has just announced um, that uh, uh, they'll be investing significantly in offshore wind turbines rather than onshore, which is kind of like, well, that's quite a politically driven decision um, because, as we know, offshore wind turbines cost 10 times as much, you know, will take probably 10 times as long. But cities can mobilize wind turbines and in their municipalities and their districts um, much quicker and much cheaper. However, you know, the impact of that is that if we as a, uh, as a city want to take forward um, wind projects that are onshore, that's not aligned with the national level government. And uh, in some, uh, I'm not an expert in this field, but certainly in terms of the, the planning process, things can get deferred up to the secretary of state for the ultimate decision on certain things like big significant infrastructure projects of which um you know uh, say a wind farm would be one of those um or in in bristol for example um the uh the expansion of the airport is currently a, a a, a, a really I know it's a slightly different sector but it's, it's a very good example whereby locally uh, the expansion was rejected but that's been appealed and that gets passed up to the planning inspectorate um, who are the national um, kind of who deal with nationally significant infrastructure projects um, so there's kind of a, there's a very much potentially an undermining role that national government in the UK can take uh, around what I would say would be medium to large size scale projects. I think in the energy transition, the smaller scale projects, are probably not quite enough to get on that radar. So, you know, you're more like your community solar scheme or your one community wind turbine. I, I Although there is still, there are, I think, believe some channels of influence through central government uh, around policy making i think that level is less significant but let's face it we need we, of course we want and need those that level of um project to happen but clearly um the the speed of change which we need we need huge big significant projects as well um uh, around particular energy production so yeah um that that's kind of the situation that um uk cities can find themselves in and not only that, just general budget cuts. Unfortunately, <laughs> the yeah, kind of, of the, um, the 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 dire straits that uh, the UK finds itself in currently isn't going to be much help to that situation. Um, but fundamentally, you know, local authorities in the UK have been um, uh, reduced and reduced and reduced in terms of their uh, disposable income. So there's potentially a chance that actually we shrink right down to just really frontline sort of adult care services for example um you know we don't do the broader reach of of activities in the long term unless we can find ways to fund those um independently which uh we have been doing you know 
in, yeah. in the energy sector and fine but um uh, there's still uh, an impact of overall budget cuts yeah and i think that emphasizes marta's point about how context specific it is i mean we had a whole other webinar and i believe that the link is in the chat now about how the nlg vende at the national level in germany um, had real enabling impact and had the impact to really, you know, support cities. Whereas, of course, we know that that's not, unfortunately, that's not necessarily the norm across contexts. Um, so we have a, a new participant who's joined our fishbowl discussion. Uh, Lena, could you please, yeah, feel free to, to provide your input. Yes, hi. Um, so I had a question that was initially uh, for Marcin following what he said about the doability of the policies that are collaboratively um, developed. And so I'm fairly situated in that question. I was following with lots of interest the French Citizen Convention of climate, on Climate, and which, uh, you know, something kind of similar, the president said that it would go ahead no matter what and without filter. And in the end, he actually uh, withdrew that promise. So I'm actually wondering, like, how, um, how often would the policies not be doable and how much is actually the municipality or the city administrators or even like the existing interests as Marta put it that are already inhabiting um, the field, how much are they ready to accept this counter discourse and this alternative ideologies in, in practice? Because as we said, like, uh, I think Marta, you also gave an example about the new anti-fracking discourse. Mm -hmm. And that has very much, I think, not been recognized by authorities. So yeah, I'm just wondering how much, how much, like, where are the barriers to that, and and how much are we actually likely to have something significant in practice that stems from collaborative governance? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you, I don't, it doesn't address someone necessarily. I, I'm gonna leave that up to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, would anyone like to jump in and, and provide a first response? I can start with the first response and then hope to um, I don't, uh, that others will jump in as well. So uh, I think it's <laughs> that's super important question, and uh, and I, I'm I was thinking a lot about it and was trying to reflect about it. And my answer to that is actually that those in power should be included into discussion. So it cannot be only citizens panel because citizens are not aware of a context, administrative, legal, or at least you know, the, to the limited extent, and practical problems, also political problems um, connected with certain processes. So um, it, is, it is an interesting conclusion in a way, because on one hand, you are trying to uh, create protected spaces where people are freely, um, um, dialoguing and coming up um, spontaneously with, with ideas and they are developing them without being disturbed. But on the other hand, if you have those who know the reality of and the practice uh, of um, environmental, for example, policies and, uh, and regulations, it's good that they are there because they can already in the face of development of ideas say, okay, this can be tricky. Of course, it can be tricky, but it's it's worthwhile to discuss this trickiness uh, upfront. Um, so this is the my, my response, but it's it's yeah. it's not based on any particular examples, really. No, I think that's very valid. Um, I'm just cognizant of the time here. We had several hands up. Fabian, Sabrina, and Masin all had raised their hands. Perhaps what I'd suggest is just asking that each of you. Uh, try to keep your responses concise. And then once you've each had a time to speak once more, um, I will pass it off to our guest speaker for some concluding thoughts. So please, I think Fabian, you were the first one to raise your hand, please go for it. Okay, I try to be fast. Um, no, just to, uh, again, I'm not sure I will answer totally to the question, but for, um, in France, some uh, legislative flexibilities make possible to take power over certain competencies as in energy production, travel, by um, defining low emission zones, pricing, uh, town planning, and local authorities can also take the role of institutional intermediary for the mobilization of citizens. So be, because um, I think it's also a central to which a minimum number of people involved in this energy transition subject, so that this becomes also a priority at the national level. So 
we you were talking about also the the climate convention and it's also part of my answer and i would say that for the um, let's say the the collectivities as the cities can also take this uh, institutional intermediary wall on the um, on the path to follow uh, maximum carbon footprint emission per citizen uh, because for the moment i think it's not really something most cities are um, communicating communicating about like this two uh, two ton uh, of co2 per person and this objective of, of neutrality and um, and also cities could be could, could take the example uh, have um, a good communication about it consistency uh, but of course this has limits as choice of con choices of consumption regulation at, at the level of uh, companies uh, because those this part of um, of rules are not decided on the, on the city scale great um sabrina would you like to to jump in Yes, um, from the Mannheim perspective, like a city administration, uh, we see that the latest shift in society, the society with the elevated political, uh, political parties, for example, uh, the Green Party in Mannheim, which is um, really strong now, now or the uh, events around Fridays for Future, um, made that um, also other political parties um, are now willing to pay more attention to energy transition. So they need like also the media attention and the publicity, which is one point for us to work with that, to get them focused on also the budgeting for these topics. Um, and on the other hand, um, this also uh, like peer pressure, also with the co-funding, we can say, um, other big cities are funding um, their energy transition like around uh, 10 million euros and um, then we can say like we have to do it as well if we want to play uh, um, a front runner city if we want to be a, a mode model for that and um, um, also there was a question about a key um, factor a key success and i think uh, for Mannheim it's very important to have businesses uh, with you um, for that journey and we are like a in very industrialized uh, region here and um, also the businesses playing an active role in climate action climate protection and climate mitigation um, so we're not pointing like uh, finger pointing on them what are they doing wrong but we are looking for um, new solutions on also with a lot of startups and with um, decentralizations in the neighborhoods so we are going directly in the districts not always on the citywide level because that's maybe also an answer to the question how we do address vulnerable persons to go in the neighborhoods and a big success for us was the climate emergency uh, plan which was i mean a lot of cities all over europe decided to do that but um, we also decided to uh, take 10 million euros um, to fund projects I, I think that's also some key uh, points that i wanted to point out here perfect thank you very much so I will give the very last word to Marcin, who had raised his hand. Um, I am aware that we're running a little bit low on time. I'd like to just remind everyone that we still have a very brief sort of concluding reflections from a partner project, another Horizon 2020 project. So if you are able to stay until just 10 minutes past 12, uh, I really invite you to, to hear from our colleagues. But first, Marcin, for a last word. Yeah, really, really quickly, just to build on what Marta already said and to answer the question about the doability <clears throat> of actions. So it, it doesn't mean, the doability doesn't mean the easy to implement actions or the easy to accept actions. It means actions that are possible to implement implemented in the terms of, you know, legal, organizational or competence issues. These are the only one excluded. Um, and uh, in, in, the, in this packet, we accepted a lot of very important and then um, and also ambitious uh, actions uh, without an initial idea how to implement this, right? For example, one of the recommendations was to cover all municipal roofs where it's possible with, uh, with uh, photovoltaic panels. So it requires a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, how to say it, capex budget, right? Uh, investment budget, sorry. Uh, a lot of you know um, audits on the uh, on the feasibility of such measure, but it was accepted and it will be implemented as committed by the president. So only only. Uh, very clearly not possible to implement solutions were were rejected and um, we uh, it was not like the people um had a discussions and then we uh, we evaluated the list we had the monitoring committee uh combined with every uh, substantial unit from the city department to provide any insights on possibilities on organizational matters but also we have expert to facilitate the dialogue so it the people were guided like since the very beginning they knew for example that something is not possible to implement and then uh, and then they they didn't waste time and they didn't go into that direction so that's i think that's that's very important in such cases and then when it comes to you know if we are now thinking about the implementation and what are the key, key success factors and so on i would say the number one success factor at least for warsaw in the pandemic for example in the very difficult budget situation is a flexibility and the flexibility in the terms of uh, partnerships different partnerships flexibility in the terms of uh, funding so i mentioned already in chat for example private public partnerships uh, like in esco formula right so when when we find an investor and then and then, and then, then it's not required to to have a lot of investment funds just to maintain the same operational costs. And after ten years, the infrastructure is ours. That's how ESCO works. Um, uh, yeah, and also, you know, to be very open to to discussing with business, it, it was also already mentioned there. The huge companies, the businesses, has uh, pretty often very broad corporate social responsible strategies and they 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 even look for potential ways to spend some money and then on on let's say higher value projects like um the city the city oriented or whatever right so it's it's all about flexibility it's all about relationships partnerships discussions and and, and openness um of the government and hopefully hopefully and uh, i think uh, with with such leader and with such management in warsaw we can do that perfect thank you very much um i really appreciate all of your inputs and i also really want to thank those who uh joined us for the fishbowl discussion i think that clearly this has been um there was so much more to talk about that perhaps in future webinars we'll seize this format and and try to have even longer discussions um, so now I'd like to ask all of you who are able to stay on for just 10 more minutes to please allow me to welcome uh, Jacob Kramer, who will be providing some concluding thoughts. And first, before going to that, one more huge thank you to our panel of speakers. We really appreciate you taking the time to have this discussion with us, and, and we hope to speak with you again uh, at a future webinar shortly. So now passing along to Jacob. Jacob will introduce the project that he is representing here, but it's a project that focuses also on social innovation, but from very different perspectives. And we wanted to invite him as something like a critical friend to synthesize really the main takeaways from this discussion, what we hope that you will all come away with, and then also to provide us just some brief context on how discussions like this on collaborative governance in social innovation in energy transition uh, really has much more relevance beyond simply this one project so please jacob take it away yeah thanks for thanks for the introduction and hey everyone um my name is jacob and i'm really glad to be here on behalf of our research team of the university of freiburg in germany and our team is also part of the urbana consortium and we as a team have mostly concerned ourselves with governance and i'm happy to synthesize some thoughts of today's webinar what i've learned from it and and then how it ties into our project and our own work giving one example and hopefully i'm going to be able to do so in under 10 minutes <laughs> and i think i have to give you some very short background information about our project about what we do as a team of that project and then i'm going to dive into how that connects to the things we learned and discussed about today so Urbana is a three year long EU project and we're also funded through the Horizon 2020 program. And we aim to synthesize and broker knowledge for sustainable and just cities generated by prior research and innovation projects. And then we wanna translate this knowledge into action. So our, our thematic focus was really at that intersection of sustainability and justice. 
And in our work package, we, we focused on the topic of governance, more specifically on governance arrangements and how they can contribute to sustainable and just cities. So one of the key questions um, from the pre presentation in the beginning was, um, what are governance arrangements related to social innovations in energy? And one of the overarching questions of our work um, is how can governance arrangements contribute to more sustainable and just cities? Um, could you go the, the slide back, please, again, Adrian? Um, and, and to answer, answer this, we, we have looked at specific interventions in different cities in Europe. Um, for example, from the energy sector, we looked at Bürger Energie Berlin, which was an effort or still is an effort to remunicipalize the Berlin energy grid. And it's also connected to the Berliner Energietisch that was mentioned before. Or another intervention that we looked at is called Repowering London, um, which is a cooperatively owned community energy initiative for residential buildings in London. And we really tried to understand the role in, of governance in making these interventions successful. And we did this with 11 in-depth cases that had arisen from previous Urbana mapping processes. Um, so these are all cases that play at that intersection between sustainability and justice. And then from these 11 cases, we tried to find the mechanisms that were crucial for the success of the project, and we called them enabling governance arrangements. And you can see our definition of that on the screen. Um, we defined enabling governance arrangements as combinations of actor constellations and institutional settings that have proven potential to support urban governance towards just and sustainable cities in several real world examples. And I think there are several key takeaways that came out of our work so far that tie into what we've heard and talked about today. And I think the first and most crucial one is that municipalities and local govern governments play a key role in providing the framework for a more sustainable future and in enabling community projects and steering them in, in lots of different ways to be successful and to reach their goals. And I think we've heard about this today in for example, in the presentation in the beginning and also at the fish boats with the, the modes uh, to govern through hierarchies, through markets, to networks. Um, some example here where that political decisions can enable community projects through policy making, through, through market regulations, by influencing energy prices, or we heard about crowdfunding at the fish bowl. And we have also heard about the ways municipalities can steer social innovations in energy and involve challenges. For example, national influences and multi-level uh, governance challenges um, from the Sonnet City's experiences. So in our work, um, multiple of our studied interventions, municipalities were, were either the key actors of the projects themselves or were very important in enabling community projects in reaching their goals. And I'm going to dive a bit into one of our enabling governance arrangements and what it is about and an example afterwards to illustrate how this is connected to what we've heard about today. And one of our key findings, one of our enabling governance arrangements is called building bridges between separate stakeholder groups. And it was crucial for a lot of the projects that we researched. And you can see in this small vignette um, that I really like um, <laughs> um, what, what it is basically about. And you can see four kind of alienish creatures here. Um, and a person connecting two of them to each other. And if you can look closely, and uh, you can see that the aliens who are, who are not connected look kind of sad or scared, while the other two look happy. So these aliens kind of represent peoples or people or groups of people who, who have a very different understanding of how a project should be done, who have very different rationalities. And the challenge here is to, to bring them together and to understand each other. So diverse voices of, for example, also marginalized groups can be heard. And we've heard about this difficulty of bringing voices and ideas together for, for example, um, from the citizen panel um, or from the experience of other sonnet cities. And we understand building bridges between separate stakeholder groups as um, individuals or organizations acting as intermediaries, um, for example, by brokering information, by translating language, by translating rationalities between different stakeholders of an initiative, by connecting certain groups to other groups, um, and that's crucial because the, the specialization of organization often makes it difficult to address the broad issues of sustainability and justice, which I believe is also crucial for the energy transition in a truly, in truly integrated way. And like even within city administrations, the, this compartmentalization into different sectors and policy fields um, can make it difficult to address these issues together. 
And I believe that intermediaries can therefore be very important to increase communication between stakeholders and to also ensure that perspective of um, diverse user groups, though the participation question of who is enabled to make their voice heard um, are considered in the planning processes. And I'm telling you all of this because I want to just give you one very brief example from our work where the municipality played a, a key role in enabling a community project to exist while acting as an intermediary. And the project I'm talking about is called Repowering London, I mentioned it before, which is a cooperatively owned community energy initiative in London. And it developed out of the local transition town initiative. And it's basically about two things. It's about promoting small scale generation and use of renewable energy among communities in London. And it's facilitating other energy efficiency initiatives while building skills and knowledge about it for, for the local youth, for example. And the sustainability department of the local government here served as an intermediary organization at the beginning, which really helped the team to organize themselves and connect to other relevant groups. Um, they provided a physical meeting space, they helped with ideas, and they helped with knowledge exchange, which we also briefly touched upon today in the, the first matrix. Um, so all in all, the municipality didn't really do that much. It was just like these three things. Um, so the providence of that space, helping with ideas and connecting like this fledgling group to, to others with more knowledge. Um, but it was enough that the project is now successfully managing their own community grid with financial returns for its members. They are spreading knowledge about it and they have um, paid over 120 interns over the last 10 years. Um, and I just wanna add here, and I think that's, that's um, interesting that the municipality was not a homogeneous actor in this as other departments of, of them were in conflict with the group, but it was the individuals of that department that helped the repairing community of like of that sustainability department. And I fully believe, and I think this is, that's also a result of our work that it often comes down to kind of individual motivation why urban sustainability initiatives are successful or, un or unsuccessful. And I could imagine the same for, for energy initiatives. And I think the, the best way to kind of create more motivated individuals is through knowledge sharing, through organizing and doing something actively together. So I think I can only stress um, how, how crucial cooperation and exchange are not only for community projects, but also for municipalities. And I think ne nearly all of our projects that were successful had some sort of knowledge exchange or cooperations with other cities and or even just some, some good exchange between departments of the municipality. Um, yeah. And like, I'm happy to happy about that. There are so many people here today and sharing and exchanging knowledge um, because I guess um, that's, well, I, I, I consider that really important. And yeah, I, I just want to say thanks again for the input from Sonnet today. And we will reflect on how it, how it complements our work. So I'm happy to stay in touch. And I think with these words, I'm just going to show you how you can stay in touch with Urbana. So with our project, if you're interested in that, because there's lots of opportunities, um, you can listen and participate in our podcast series. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on LinkedIn. You can sign up to our newsletter. You can get engaged with our wiki. You can participate in one of our community conversations. Um, the next one's going to be at the 23rd of February. Sadly, the last one was just yesterday, so uh, you have missed out on that probably. And you can apply for our next big arena event, which is the 18th and 19th of March, which is happening at the 18th and 19th of March. And it's about what kinds of governance arrangements enable just and sustainable cities. Um, yeah, and it's still open for three more days or four more days. And I've posted all these informations here in the chat. So if you want to click on any of them, you're invited to. We'll also post all of this on the Sonnet Twitter feed. I think that clearly there's just so much more for us to discuss that the idea of joining this next uh, arena event in March to continue to push the conversation forward. I think that it would be a great opportunity for, for those who have engaged with us so far today. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you very much. And thank you also to all of our participants who have stuck with us through to the end of this. We know we went a little bit long, but we really appreciate your participation and your active contributions. Um, I think without further ado, we can just say thank you and, and close up the discussion and, and invite you all to please stay in touch with us as you have any additional questions or, or inputs. <laughs>